started. There will be a few people probably chiming in here as we go along. Um, I want to welcome you to our Wings for Widows 2021 community Zoom call series and happy St. Patrick's Day. I went looking in my closet so that I would be wearing green tonight. Um, we're really thankful that you chose to uh, join us this evening and take time out of your out of your day to be enriched by something that we present tonight. We hope that that will happen. I'm Leanne Lorian, and I'm one of the volunteers. There are many of us with this amazing organization. And our purpose is to provide financial coaching and education for new widows and widowers to help them achieve financial wellness after the loss of a loved one. And we do a lot more. We want you to know that you're just not walking this journey alone. And we mean to get you in touch, in touch with one another, help you gain a sense of community with a group of people who understand and get what you're going through. Mm -hmm. Please know that there are people who care for you and they wanna hear your story and help you find a way to write the next chapter. That's what Wings for Widows is about. Tonight, we have a wonderful lineup of speakers that I'll introduce to you in just a moment. Our call will last about an hour. Please keep your mute button on. And when you want to make a comment or ask a question, use the chat icon at the bottom of your screen. I'll field the questions as time allows. At the end, you'll also see information about our next call and about our speakers. So if you do have questions that are more individualized, let us know and we will get those questions to our speakers. Um, <clears throat> the call is being recorded as well, as well as all of our Zoom calls have been recorded and you can go to our YouTube channel and refresh or watch any of the ones you've missed. Um, I want to shine a spotlight on our enrichment classes. We just confirmed today that we'll be doing two enrichment classes this spring, starting the first week of May. And I just got this nailed down today. So this is fresh off the press and it isn't even on our website yet. But starting May 3rd, Chris Bentley, our executive director, will be reprising his class on legacy planning. This is a very important topic, especially for those of us who are the last one in a couple, because you wanna leave your family with a orderly end of life plan for you. And Chris will help you go through the project of doing that with a workbook. It just makes it step-by-step step and very much easier to achieve. And then in addition to that, um, starting on May 7th and going for six Thursday nights, Jenny Schrodel, our wonderful grief counselor from Presbyterian Homes, will be um, repeating her class on grief explorations. So be sure to check out our website in the next week or so. Those classes should pop up and you'll be able to register for them. I'm going to introduce our first speaker. He is Grant Meyer. He's one of our financial coaches for Wings for Widows. He grew up here in the Twin Cities in Coon Rapids and attended Concordia University. He received his degree in finance with a minor in international business and Spanish. He's a certified financial planner with 12 years of experience helping clients. In addition to volunteering for Wings for Widows, Grant serves with the Financial Planning Association. He's married and has two young daughters and an extended family here in the area. He loves to serve people and help them understand the complexities of financial planning 
and find meaning with their money. And I've heard great things that Grant can make this whole area of cybersecurity plain, even to those of us who have a hard time understanding it. So please welcome Grant. And thank you so much, Grant, for taking your time this evening to help us out. Thank you, Leanne, for that wonderful introduction. And to add on to her comment, if you hear some pounding on the floor above me, the two and five-year-old are getting ready for bath time. So just, you know, ignore that background noise. Um, and my hope today really is to, um, you know, while my main job is a financial advisor, so, you know, managing money, dealing with retirement, things like that, part of my job is to also kind of help my clients stay secure, keep their money secure. And the um, reason why we're talking here today is I actually was doing a coaching call with a widow and we began discussing these concepts and we thought there's some real good nuggets of information here and that we should bring this to a larger audience. I'm really excited to share all of this and do my best to help translate some of this technical cybersecurity world into some actionable tips that everybody ha uh, can take advantage of. And let's get my screen here going and there we go so everybody should be able to see um, my main slide here and we go we're going to go through about um, you know I think time will allow me about nine or ten slides I'm going to cover various topics um, at any point in time um, someone's monitoring chat so if you have questions I'll do my best to address the questions and I will say that I'm more than happy to do a follow-up if somebody has a, a specific question, if I didn't clarify something, um, just because I know we're going to cover a lot of our many different areas. And so just uh, follow up with Wings for Widows and they'll be able to get us in touch. The first thing I want to talk about tonight is security around your credit cards, credit reports, debit cards, and things like that. When you go through financial coaching for with Wings, Wings for Widows, one of the things we talk about and something that everybody should do that I do for myself and for my families, we talk about freezing your credit report. So there are some uh, proactive things you can do to protect your identity and protect your credit history, one of which is freezing your report. To freeze your report, you visit each one of the three credit bureaus, Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. Now, if you don't feel comfortable doing it online, online is the, it's pretty user friendly. Um, and there are links for each of these that we can pass along, but you can also do this over the phone by calling them directly. What a credit freeze does is a credit freeze will prevent your credit from being accessed by anyone, even yourself which prevents people from opening up fraudulent accounts in your name. So this is a big thing to do pretty much no matter what, uh, you know, like I said, I've done it uh, for myself, for all my clients, for my family members. And the only thing to consider is if you're about to go get a new loan, a mortgage or a credit card, you will have to temporarily lift your freeze and you will get a pin number, a special six digit pin number to temporarily lift your freeze. So that way, whoever you're getting your loan through can actually run your credit. And then you just refreeze it. And this will help prevent any fraudulent charges uh, or accounts being opened on your behalf. Now, one common question I get um, around kind of credit and debit is, should we, should we be using credit cards online? Should we be using debit cards? And kind of which is best for online shopping, which is, good in the real world. And I gave a presentation with somebody who leads cybersecurity with the FBI. And he was talking with me about the dangers of a debit card. And here's why I'm going to talk a little bit about the dangers of a debit card. So the first thing I want to show everybody on this call here, and you'll have to look at my screen, is something that you may not be aware of is credit card or debit card skimming. So I'm going to set this scene up for everybody. Um, the person who is filming this video is on vacation in Vienna. Uh, wouldn't it be nice to be able to travel again and be in public? And he's actually a security researcher, and he's aware of 
credit card skimming. What he does is he goes around to different things and pulls on them and tries to take them apart. And he's in uh, a tourist spot in Vienna and finds a credit card skimmer. So I'm gonna play this clip here. It's very short and you don't need to hear the sound at all. So what he's doing is he's just showing that it's a very public area, a lot of foot traffic, and there's a bank ATM outside right here. So what he does is he was going to withdraw some cash out of this ATM and he walks up to it. And right there on the screen part, that's where you would normally put in your debit card to withdraw money or credit card to get a cash advance. And watch what happens when he pulls on this. Right now he's zooming in to say, you know, notice there's a little weird glue around the edge he, he thought it looked suspicious, so he gave a tug. And watch what happens here. You see how that came right off? So what this is, and then what he does, so there's a better view. So what this is, is this is a credit card skimmer. So on the inside of this, there's a little piece that will read your credit card or debit card, and it stores the number and then the thief can come by and pull that off and get access to your credit information. Um, or some of them are even wireless now and they can just drive up and with Bluetooth technology, take uh, the information off the credit skimmer. He then goes over to the uh, person who's about to put their credit card in there. He says, hold on. And he tries to tug on that one. That one's safe, no issues there. So that's a credit skimmer. And one, there are two different lessons to take away. One is you can always tug on uh, ATM or when you're at a gas station, look where you put your credit card in. There's usually a security stripe, uh, a piece of tape over that to protect you from skimming. Um, but you always wanna be aware of skimming. The second thing is if you're using your debit card, here's where the danger comes in is if you put your debit card in one of those skimmers, your debit card is linked directly to your bank account. It's real money. Your credit card, you know, that's American Express's money or Chase's money or, you know, Visa's money, whoever. It's not really your money, but your debit card is linked directly to your bank account. So if you put it in and it happens to be a skimmer, or if you're shopping online, you put your debit card in online and the website gets hacked for whatever reason or it's a bad website, now they have direct access to your money. Now, most banks will certainly refund you the money. They'll do an investigation. They'll understand it's fraud. You know, this is not new. But the issue is, in the meantime, you could have your mortgage payment coming due. You could have other bills coming due. You could have things drawing money out of your account. And then if your bank balance happens to be drawn down, you miss a payment, it can cause all sorts of headaches. I actually gave this presentation one time and a person worked at Wells Fargo and he said, I'm so glad you're saying all this to the public because he said, I literally had this happen where a person had their debit card stolen, their checking account was drained. It took us two days to get the money back in. But in the meantime, they had auto debits coming out. Those auto debits got late payment fees and it just kind of spirals out of control. So I always recommend A, using a credit card for safety when shopping online. And B, when you go up to take cash out, if you do, prefer you go straight into the bank rather than using an ATM if possible. If you need to use an ATM or if you need to put your credit card into say like a gas pump, double check, make sure that it doesn't look suspicious and just be a little bit cautious. And I think that's a pretty big eye opener for most people is seeing those uh, credit skimmers. Email security. This is probably the biggest area that I see where most people could improve. Um, you know, the credit card thing, just making one switch from your debit to credit, pretty easy. Email security, another great place that uh, most people could improve. Now, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten calls from people saying, Grant, I've received an email and it says that my American Express credit card has been blocked and I need to click a link and provide them information, should I do that? And I always tell anybody, be very leery of any emails you get that have any sense of urgency. So they try to frighten you. You need to act within 10 days or this will be locked out. Know that the IRS never emails you. Social security will not be emailing you to get your information. 
be very uh, cautious if you see any sort of links in clicking on those. Look for misspellings, double check the email address. And the best thing to do, the biggest piece of advice I can give you is always make an outbound phone call to the business if you think it could be legitimate. So for example, I had a client who got an email from American Express saying that their card was blocked. And I had them, rather than looking in the email and calling the number in the email, I said, um, I went to American Express's website, their official website, and I said, here's their number, call them. And sure enough, the email was not legitimate and I had them delete it. Now he hadn't clicked on any links, he hadn't filled in any information, but it was most certainly a scam. An example of how to spot a suspicious email. So I have pulled one up here and Gmail does a great job of flagging them, but I'm gonna zoom in on this because it can be hard to see a little bit, but I want everybody to look at this email address. Do we think that foo 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 3243 at gmail.com is a legitimate email that's gonna be talking about $8 million? No. This, uh, we have you know, an, uh, an odd email address, we have odd dollar amounts, we have request for information, head officer in charge, you know, that's not a legitimate title. There are so many red flags in here, um, email address and odd spelling, you know, grammatical errors. This is instantly a red flag and Gmail captures that, but if it had slipped past Gmail's uh, safety security features, these would be big giveaways um, in general. So, you know, first thing, use your credit card over a debit card, freeze your credit. Next thing, um, pretty much just be extremely suspicious of most emails, be skeptical and don't click any links. That would probably be the biggest takeaway for emails here. Moving on to the next thing, and I know this is fast paced here, but just being uh, mindful of everybody's time, the next thing I wanna talk about is computer security. And this is a big topic. Um, people get master's degrees and doctorate degrees in this. So we're certainly not going to be experts, but there are some real basic steps that anybody with any level of technical expertise can do to help secure their computer and devices. The biggest thing to do is just know that um, Microsoft and Apple are continuously updating their systems to protect themselves against the malicious threats in the world. So the best thing you can do for yourself is to make sure that your computer software stays up to date and that you have an antivirus program. Those two things alone uh, in and of themselves are going to prevent many different attacks against your computer. If you don't know how to do that, um, most of them are automatic nowadays, but if you don't know how to do that, seek out somebody who can help you out. If you don't have a technical person in your life, if you have a Mac computer, Apple has a service called their Genius Bar that you can bring your Mac in there and they'll actually teach you and show you how to use it and make sure it's up to date. Um, Best Buy has a service you can subscribe to called Geek Squad where they can assist you with technical things as well. So I'd consider looking into those. And one last tip for, secu for security purposes for computers is consider bookmarking your important websites. And what I mean by bookmarking is, let me grab a, a new browser window here. So let's say you have a browser window, rather than going and typing in, you know, US Bank, and then searching for it, and then clicking a link, what you want to do is you want to go to the legitimate website. We look for the HTTPS up in the top. And then we want to click and make it a favorite. And so then what you're going to do is you're just going to use your favorite from now on rather than searching for it every time. And the reason why we do this is because there are often websites that if you misspell something by a couple of letters, it can look like the real website, but it's really not. And it's made to capture your information and, and take your data. So I always recommend bank websites, credit card websites, um, bookmark them, save them on your computer and use the bookmark rather than trying to type in the name every single time. Because we're all human, I've mistyped things, we all have typos. And so using a bookmark helps prevent that. 
So next thing, talking about online browsing, I think this is everybody's headache, is passwords. How do you remember the passwords? What is a secure password? And I'll give you a couple of tips uh, to kind of help with that. But first, I thought I would share this chart. And this shows you how long it would take a computer to crack your password based upon how long it is and based upon how complex it is. So if your password, say, is seven characters long and you have upper and lowercase letters, um, it would only take five minutes to crack that password. Um, even if you have seven characters and you have upper and lower and you have numbers and you have symbols, it only takes about 17 hours for the sophisticated computers to crack your password. Generally, if possible, you want to start with at least 10 to 11, 10 to 12 characters. If you come out to 18 right here, it's one quintillion years, uh, which is just a long time. So never basically is the answer. But um, start from 10 to 12 characters. And now you're going to ask me, Grant, that's great, but how am I going to remember a 12-character password? And the answer to that is leveraging um, a new technology out there. Let me zoom back out here. There we go. And consider using a password manager to help keep them safe. So what a password manager is, I want everybody to picture in their mind, picture a safe and think about a safe and you know the combination and inside that safe on a piece of paper are all your usernames and passwords written down. And you don't need to remember any of them because they're written down. You only need to remember the combination to that safe. That's exactly how password managers work. So there is one built into Edge, the browser, and Chrome, the browser. Or you can use things called LastPass, L-A-S-T-P-A-S-S. -S. So I'll just type that in really quick for people. So there's LastPass is a very popular one. Or there is 1Password. And if you use 1Password or LastPass, um, what both of them do is they help you remember your password so you don't have to. And then the cool part is, is you can go and make those 12 digit passwords and you don't have to worry about remembering each one. My time's running up here, so I have one more thing just to touch on and then we'll move on here. So for passwords, avoid common passwords like password and make sure that if you have any important websites like a bank account, don't reuse that password on other sites. So the last one I wanna to touch on, which is really common, is phone scams. And I know that I'm not the only person that gets a lot of uh, bad calls nowadays on my cell phone. I just wanna make a point that the IRS does not call people. If you ever get a threatening call from the IRS, it's not them immediately hang up. If you happen to have grandkids out there, your grandkids are never in trouble in Mexico and they need you to wire money to them, immediately hang up. Microsoft will never call you to tell you they found a bug on your computer. And if they ever do, hang up. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people, well, Microsoft called me, they told me I had a virus. So then they had me download some software to fix the virus. And then I needed to pay for the software. And they gave them a credit card and they ended up installing bad software on the computer too. So just know you're never gonna call, get a call from a company telling you they're here to fix your computer. That just doesn't happen. And be aware of anything suspicious on your cell phone. Try not to download any apps that you don't know and trust. And with that, I know it's a lot of information in a short amount of time for everybody, but I'm hoping that everybody uh, could take at least one tip away from all of that. And if there's any questions, uh, happy to take a question here or there. Otherwise, Leanne, I'll turn it back over to you. I don't see any questions in the chat box, um, but one of the questions I had is someone told me about a password manager that actually automatically changes your password. So you don't, I mean, not only 
do you not have to remember it, but it for security reasons will change it periodically. Yep. Do you know about that? So it, it depends on the website and the program, but LastPass, for instance, has the ability to automatically change passwords. And one thing that I do want to add, Leanne, uh, since we we're bringing up passwords I didn't touch on is on any website that allows you to pick two-factor authentication, that adds an extra layer of security. So when you're logging in, you'll get a text message on your cell phone. So I think many people, I see a lot of shaking heads. If you ever have the option of adding two-factor authentication where you get text messages, that is the best thing to do because then even if the bad people steal your passwords, they don't have your cell phone and that's just one more layer to help protect you. Great, that made perfect sense to me. So that, that passes my test. Wonderful. Thank you, thank my you pleasure, very much. Everybody. Does anyone have any questions that I can field to Grant right now? Okay, then I'm gonna go ahead and introduce my dear friend, Janelle. Um, I have known Janelle since college, and that was like maybe 10 years ago, right, Janelle? <laughs> um, Janelle and, um, and I have been friends for a very long time, and you will never meet a more warm and delightful person. Janelle is not a person that fits in any box, and yet she's going to make you feel right at home, no matter what you're doing. She has been a social worker for many years, uh, most recently with Presbyterian Homes. Um, she loves senior citizens and is, has a heart for ministry to them. She's also a Hebrew teacher, a scholar, a speaker, a mom, a grandma, and a world traveler. And I am so thrilled to have Janelle with us tonight because she's also a lifelong journaler. And she's gonna give us some insights into how we can make that healing habit a part of our lives as well. So welcome Janelle, happy to have you. Thank you so much Leanne for that kind introduction. I, uh, I, I wish I were in the, I wish I was in the room with all of you because I much prefer um, being in person with people and I could see your faces and, and uh, be more intimate. But I want to say good evening. And I know that you are all very brave. I want to say uh, you're brave warriors. You are um, under the wings. I love that theme of your program, your ministry, that it's under the wings, um, wings for widows. And maybe it means that wings to fly as well. And uh, I know that um, years ago a friend of mine uh, when I was discouraged she said to me you need to start journaling and I want to say this was maybe shortly after college and I've been uh, regularly practicing journaling since then I know you've been talking about journaling in some of your recent um, times together and I want to just tell you a little bit about what journaling is as far as my definition I know you'll all have thoughts about this too but I see journaling as a check-in tool. I see it as a um, opportunity to manage stress. Um, I think we all have stress at times and I see it as a time to um, put on, put down on paper things you're feeling so that you're not carrying them around. I think I sleep better after I write things down. In fact, I even have a pad of paper by my bedside that in the middle of the night, if something's going round and round in my head, I will write down just a word or two to remind me that that's something I need to journal about because I'm, I'm mulling it and it's keeping me um, awake. Um, I think it's a way of hearing the truth. Sometimes when we are believing things that aren't true and we start journaling about the disturbing things we're believing are true, um, it's a reset. And I, when I journal, I expect, I call God Abba, I call him Father, and I also call him Tate, which is the Hebrew word for daddy. 
And I'll sometimes say, Tate, this is on my mind and it's bugging me. And like if I'm arguing with somebody or in a battle at work or there's something disturbing, I journal about it first and foremost before I start to engage others. Um, I find that journaling can be a good first thing to do um, so that when you proceed, you're going to proceed with more wisdom and insight. But journaling can be a way to watch and to wait and to listen. I think that we all, you know, God gave us two ears and one mouth. And that's purposeful because I think we're supposed to be listening twice as much as we are speaking. And journaling, I think, can be a time to be still. And I try to journal at the same time every day. It's part of my quiet time where I, I'm reading and studying and journaling. And I have a friend who used to say to me, if something shimmers, like when you're reading the Bible or reading a book or looking at something like an article, if something shimmers or jumps off the page, then spend time with that. Um, maybe it's a word or maybe it's a concept or maybe it's a story. Um, but I do pay attention to that. And I can, um, I find myself getting, you know how you lose track of time. Sometimes when you're journaling, I just think, oh my word, what time is it? I got to get going because it can, it can be a good losing track of time. Journaling can be helpful and healing. It's a way to capture thoughts that might be flying all over the place. Um, it sort of, it grounds me. It helps me to know how to plant my feet firmly on the ground. It, it is a good way to explore grief. I know that I'm talking to a, a lot of widows in, on this um, evening here on this platform. And I wanna read something I came across. I don't know who the author is, I'm afraid to say, but this is a, a, a grief quote. It says, grief never ends, but it changes. It's a passage, not a place to stay. Grief is not a sign of weakness, nor a lack of faith. It's the price of love. And I know you grieve because you loved. And so it's, it's um, a, a precious thing that we grieve. And grief comes in many forms. But I'm going to just um, share briefly that I think grief can be very positive And grief can be also very destructive. And I want to talk about, um, I think journaling can help you to as you journal about your loved one, it's helping you to remember, which is positive. It's helping you to capture things that you don't want to lose about your loved one. Grief can be positive because it's a moment of lingering and lingering is good. We race around way too much. I think lingering can be a real healing time. And I think it's also grief can be positive because it can help you have gratitude. But ways that grief can be destructive is that we, um, we, when we're grieving, we forget sometimes, we forget what is true, or we might find ourselves despairing and having no hope. And sometimes grief can feel, feel like you're lay, layering things, grief upon grief upon grief, it's just, it's just like getting to be very heavy and burdensome, and you can feel almost buried. And I'm sure you can all relate to that feeling of being buried. I, I You know what I realized today that the, I don't know um, if you realize what the very last action before Jesus died on the cross was, what his very final act was. And I don't know if, if you wanna think about it for a minute, but I'll tell you his final act was on the cross he entrusted the care of his widowed mother to John. And I just thought that was so encouraging that the last thought he has had was for a widow, his mom, whom he really loved and didn't want to leave her um, without help and without support. And I just thought that was a very encouraging thing. 
So what distracts us from journaling? What keeps us from doing this a very important activity? Depression can keep us from journaling. Having too much anxiety, you know, sometimes when you're, you're full of anxiety, it's hard for you to sit still or calm yourself down enough to be focused or we're too hurried. We've got too many things going on. Um, it's, it might be necessary to schedule a journaling time and it could be any time of the day that works for you. I've heard of people starting journaling by doing a gratitude or grateful journal. I'm sure some of you have heard about it because it's a popular thing to do where you journal for just a few minutes every day and you record five things that you find yourself grateful for. Five things. I know that might seem daunting sometimes when you're very much in grief, but it can be as simple as I'm glad I have five fingers. I'm glad I can smell the coffee I'm drinking. But, but five things, and if you do that, they say for 21 days in a row, it becomes a habit to journal and it actually changes your brain so that you actually are, you're gonna be more tending toward gratitude than not. But I think something else that can distract us from journaling is um, being stuck or frozen. Um, and I think we all have felt that at times things um, make us stuck, but getting journaling can help you get unstuck. Feeling hopelessness or despair or feeling lonely or wondering if anybody really cares, especially maybe God doesn't even care, you might think, and that would make you um, not rush towards journaling or feeling very isolated. The very center of the Bible, and maybe some of you know this, but there's in Hebrew, the very center of the Torah are two words, the same two words, and they are derash, derash, which means carefully investigate. So it, it, right in the center of God's word is a reminder to us that it's a good practice to carefully investigate um, our lives, our situation, our thoughts. Journaling can be done on paper with pen or pencil. Journaling can be done in the form of art. Sometimes people can uh, draw or or doodle or um, using different colored pens can be fun. People, you can do journaling on a keyboard, on a piano. Um, you can take a walk and journal your thoughts out loud with the Lord on a walk. It doesn't have to always be in a written form. It can be journaling with a friend, maybe an accountability situation where you um, speak to a friend about your thoughts and it's a trusted friend who um, might pray for you or give you advice or uh, give you some feedback or keep you accountable if you're trying to change something. Um, starting small is good. Um, changing your surroundings might be helpful. If you could be outside and journal, that might be helpful or um, make sure you date your journals so you can remember certain things that happened on certain dates. So you can reread them and refer to your journaling. Um, you can keep things in your journals like leaves, beautiful leaves or four leaf clovers or things you might find on your walk. Um, let it be a pleasurable thing to journal and a thing that will be for your eyes only so that you feel free to, to uh, uh, talk freely, I would say to the Lord about these things or to yourself and try not to be, um, try not to be stuck in the place of wallowing in self-pity. I think it's easy to do when there's so much going on. This year especially has been a year of difficulty trying um, to keep it positive when there's just been one negative event after another, it's, it's tough. But I think journaling can, journaling can help you to feel joy. I like to say that one of the New Testament commandments 
And the New Testament has almost twice as many commandments as the Old. I don't know if you know that, but there's 613 Old Testament commandments and 120 some New Testament commandments. And one of the New Testament ones is rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And it's, it's a commandment. It's not a suggestion for those of you that um, choose to let Bible, the Bible be your guide and the Lord help you. You can still grieve and feel grief and choose joy. That's kind of one of the beautiful things about joy is that it um, is not exclusive. <laughs> it can share it can share a place with other emotions, but grief then with joy, coupled with grief, joy can make it um, tolerable and um, it can make it productive, I would say too. So with um, the idea, I wanna say too, that one of the things that journaling has done for me is it helps me to walk and live and abide in a place called shalom shalom is the hebrew word for peace but if you parse out each of the letters in the hebrew word shalom you get a beautiful instruction what it says in hebrew is to destroy the authority that establishes chaos and i want to say that when we let journaling help us to develop shalom it can be a very healing time for us shalom also can mean health and wholeness and um, integrity so when we let our life um, be fashioned by shalom it can be a very um, grounding and helpful thing and journaling can help bring shalom when sometimes when I'm arguing with with um with a child or a spouse um I will first bring my anger to the Lord in a journaling situation and journal about it and then go talk to the child or the friend or the spouse and it's amazing how sometimes I it, it's just over I don't even need to do anything about it because um I've received the truth uh, from just that episode of, of journaling about it. The truth is a very, um, today it's a very elusive thing, truth is. Um, if you will hear a lot of people saying that they're telling the truth, you will hear a lot of people say that everything else is lies. You'll, you'll hear, you just don't even know when you're getting the truth right now. It's, it's a time like none other. Um, but in Hebrew, the word emet means truth, emet. And to spell that in English is E-M-E-T. But in Hebrew, it's the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the middle letter, and the last letter. So you've heard people say the whole truth, nothing but the truth, because it's the first, middle, and last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So it's a very, um, it's a telling word that explains what truth is. Um, another thing that I think that journaling can help with is the idea of Lashan Hara. Lashan Hara is a Hebrew uh, word or concept that means no evil tongue. And if we, if we tend to um, gossip or have a tongue that speaks evil, journaling about things will curb that. It will help you to say less, because you have said you've done a lot of the, the verbiage on a page and perhaps you won't need to say as much <laughs> because it won't be necessary. So Lashan Hara again means no evil speech. Um, and I know I've got 10 minutes left so I will just go a little longer but please if you have questions, um, hold on to those or, or bring them to the chat room because um, Leanne will take those questions and we can bring those up in a little bit. I want to share that um, there are, there's a verse in the Bible in Hosea. And Hosea is one of the prophets. It might not be a book you've read much, but in Hosea 14, 2, it says, take with you words and return to the Lord. And I love that verse because the Lord 
wants us to take our words to him. Um, and, you know, he's called, Abba is, and, and Yeshua, his son, are called the living word. And so as we bring our words forward in the form of a journaling exercise or a prayer, he then will share his word with us. And so there's an exchange. It's like a circle of words. Journaling can be just that, a circle of healing words uh, that bring you to um, a good point to be so, so that you're in this loving circle with God. And, um, you know, I, I was reading today, too, that do you know who the first widow in the Bible was? And I, I, I think, you know, I wanted to say that it might be Ruth. But the first widow in the Bible were, at least what this author said, the first widow were Adam and Eve, because they had this, it's sort of like they were one with God in the garden. It was like he was their father and they were the bride, you know, so and so when they lost that relationship with God, they um, lost their groom and they were excluded from the garden where they had this perfect fellowship with him so it's like something i'd never thought about before so there is this um this need in all of us to get back to the garden it's we want to return to gani Dan, to the garden of eden that's something it's it's in us it's inherently something we want to do we want to return to this place where there's no mosquitoes <laughs> and where there's unbroken fellowship and food to eat and and you're taken care of and you live forever. And so I think journaling can be helpful in helping us um, in that journey back to Ghani Don. Um, not too many days ago, my husband had an episode where his blood pressure dropped dangerously low to 63 over 49. So I told Leanne uh, days after that, that I said, I could have become a widow in um on the 2nd of march it was um i got a call from er that he you need to come quick <laughs> and so you know we don't know what is ahead of us we don't know what the future holds and what is literally around the next corner but um but journaling can help us to deal with whatever comes our way um maybe i'll stop there because there's about are there any questions that are in the chat room? But I would love to take any questions that people might have. I don't see any questions right now. Okay. Um, Janelle, would you repeat? I was trying to write down really quick. Yes. What what the meaning of the word shalom is again? Yes. Destroy authority. I got that far. Yes. It's so it's to destroy the authority that establishes chaos. So there's four letters. I'll say it again. So there's four letters in shalom. When you spell it in Hebrew, it means to destroy the authority that establishes chaos. Because chaos is what we have in our gardens if we don't pick the weeds on a regular basis. Chaos is what just happens in life if we aren't attentive to it. Chaos happens if, in our home if we, if we don't do the dishes or clean up the house or make your bed. Um, chaos rules and reigns unless we pronounce shalom. And that's something that... Um, is a very it's like I think the most powerful tool that God gave us so through journaling we can we can pronounce shalom over our health if it's poor over our um, troubles our trials our sufferings we can pronounce pronounce shalom over um, the space between us if we're um, dealing with difficulties in relationships we can pray shalom over our houses and our places of work. We can pray shalom when we travel, um, that we meet all of our connections. It's, it's a beautiful um, thing to incorporate into journaling is 
the concept of peace and wholeness and health. You said to me when we were talking, um, because you sent me a picture of you holding a fish. Oh yeah. I want you to tell us about why you picked that picture. Well, Leanne, bless her heart, she asked me to um, send her a, a picture of what I wanted um, to talk about. And I sent a picture of me holding a great big fish. I like to fish. My husband especially likes to fish and I go with him. And I recently, in fact, I often out catch him. I don't know why he doesn't like that, but I do. And I caught a really big fish recently. And I sent the picture to Leanne and I said, journaling is a good catch. And um, what I meant by that is when we take the time to journal, it's like catching God's words and his heart for us. It's like, it's like fishing. Journaling is like fishing for words and images and truths from God. That's what I would say. Because I believe that God is always speaking to us, but we just aren't paying attention to what he's saying. And, and we aren't trying to capture those words um, in a specific way. And I, I so journaling to me has been um, eye-opening because I feel like I've been able to understand what the Father's saying to me. And that's been very healing and hopeful. I like that metaphor so much because it puts the energy not on, on my responsibility to figure out what I want to say on the page, but on being still and listening to what I need to hear. Yep, that's exactly, that's exactly right. And after you and I talked, I thought, that is such a different and refreshing way of thinking about this. Yeah, yes. really helped me. Good. You know, I don't know, but do, do people have the chat button or is it somehow disabled? I don't have one either. So just unmute. If you have a question, unmute yourself and ask your question. I'm sorry. I don't know why that is, but I think it has to do with who's the host. But anyway, if you have a question for Janelle, go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Well, Janelle, I was going to ask you, and maybe this is a with journaling being su such a sweet time and so important, do you ever think about the what happens to all your journals? I mean, you write in them with it being for your your own life and and you know talking to God, but what happens to those journals? It's kind of that legacy thing, you know. I mean, it's probably the most intimate conversation you have what happens to them I told I've told my husband to burn them <laughs> but I said you know if I I there's nothing in there that I would um be arrested for or anything you know it's not like so it's like I I tell him if you want to read them but I don't think he wants to read them but sometimes I when I reread a journal I will tear out certain pages I've even thrown away some over the years but but I will tear out certain pages that are that have been powerful for me, where I feel like God has really broken through for me and and I've understood something and I've been touched by something. So I do have a folder that I call God's love notes to me, and I keep those things. Um, but you know, you can throw away your journal after 10 years if you want. It's not like they're um but I do a lot of journaling now in my Hebrew study. Um, when I'm teaching Torah, I do a lot of journaling that is just powerful um, for my own uh, ability to understand Hebrew and to teach it. So it's, um, it can be useful in your scripture study as well as your personal development. Good, thank you. Mm-hmm. Do you know of any resources for a journal that would have prompts in it 
so it wouldn't be a blank page perhaps with uh, the things that you want to be thankful for. Place yes, in the document your mood or your feeling. Because um, I'm a widow, like, am I crying less today than I did five days ago? <laughs> um, something that when we talked about the anxiety and the depression, and I just hate writing. I totally hate writing. Well, and and some journals don't have lines on them, so you could it could be you could be drawing more. That could make it worse. Yeah. That's worse, okay? Or you could make your own journal. Maybe you want to make your own journal about, um, there's maybe two or three things you want to do, a check-in every day where you'd make your own journal and just staple it together with your own copied pages. But Barnes and Noble and other bookstores have a, a wide array of journals. And um, so you could go look and see um, what kinds of and maybe you want to just be a little tiny journal where you just write a few thoughts every day or just write one bible verse every day or it doesn't have to be paragraphs of, of words it can be any amount of words that feel good to you i was just looking for prompts like you might have for small children in school that they would get a writing prompt Mary, I've um, seen I've seen Pinterest pages. Do you do Pinterest? Yeah, I was just hoping somebody could say, "Hey, here it is. This is great." Right. <laughs> <laughs> go to Pinterest board or go to Barnes and Noble, or you can order it for Amazon. You know, like I never thought about writing down a Bible verse. Mm -hmm. so, I've actually found a book like that at Barnes and Noble. It was actually um, given to me when my husband died two years ago. Mm -hmm. It has the prompts in it and it, it you journal every, I think it's for like four years. So the same date comes across, there's prompts, there's Bible verses. And I actually revisited it because I kind of got out of my journaling a little bit. And now as I'm the last month or so, the anniversary of Tom's death is this next month. So I'm getting a little weird again. And I'm like, you know, I looked mm -hmm. in the book and I'm like, flip back the year before going, okay, I'm better than I was last year. So that's kind of how I benchmark, but definitely Barnes and Noble has that book. And I found it, um, my friend got it for me and it's, um, like in the self area with the grief section so that it really does exist. And that's mm -hmm. where mine came from. Do you know the name of it? I will look and maybe I will email you then. Um, okay. Because I know I've got it upstairs um, mm -hmm. because I'm writing in it again, <laughs> um, just because. But I will email that to you in case people are interested. Thank you. That answers my question. And Mary, I've got one too. And I'll see you on Saturday and I'll show it to you. It's not a Christian one. It's kind of a funny one that my kids got me. It's got this whole paragraph on the front that like, you know, gloom and doom and the whole world's falling <laughs> apart. And I'm going to write in this book. <laughs> I'll show it to you. It's pretty funny. But they, <laughs> both of my kids got it for me independently. So oh, wow. Wow. I think, oh, I think it'd be helpful for my daughters. Yes. They That's like to write pretty. much better than me, but they won't journal about this loss of their father. And yes, yeah, something like that might help. I agree. Thank well, you. Thank, thank you, Janelle. I think, I think we're, yeah, we're up to eight o'clock. I just want to Thank you and Grant so much for this just wonderful evening. I've learned so much. I filled two pages. <laughs> good, good. So I just think, you know, all of us are, are journeying down this, this difficult road. And I think Janelle's got some great tips that have really helped me to, to get encouraged to, to do a better job of just listening to what God has to say to me. Mm -hmm. um, thank you to all of you for taking time out of your life to attend this evening. Um, our next call is on April 7th. And at that time, 
Our speaker is Mary McCoy, who is a longtime hospice nurse, and she's going to give us some information. Her title is Dispelling the Myths About Hospice. And then Denise Gibson will be giving us, um, she's one of our, our um, enrichment class teachers, and she'll be talking about consumer safety, which is a little bit of a different slant than what Grant talked about on cyber safety tonight. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing those. You can just go on the Wings for Widows website to sign up for those if you haven't already. Um, also make sure to note uh, to yourself if you're interested in our legacy planning class or the grief explorations class that will be offered in May um, to keep an eye out for those to be posted on our website. You could sign up for those. So once again, thank you everyone for coming tonight and I hope you have a wonderful evening and we'll see you again in a couple weeks.